Hello, I am Joel Bloom at New Jersey Institute of Technology. We pride ourselves on being part of the Newark community and its advancements in technology, the economy, and the growth of the city. That's why we are very proud to partner with the Caucus Educational Corporation to produce Newark at the Crossroads right here on the NGIT campus. We hope you enjoy this special series. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, TD Bank, PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. The New Jersey Education Association, Century 21 Construction, Verizon, and by the North Ward Center. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got it this? Back. Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. It is my pleasure here at uh, the beautiful campus of the New Jersey Institute of Technology, NGIT, at the Jim Wise Theater to introduce my colleague and friend, Mike Schneider, who is an icon, a, uh, someone who uh, we've all looked up to in this business for a long time. Before we talk about On the Trail, which is a terrific PBS uh, series that has uh, premiered, uh, we'll talk about it in a second. Give me, give me the other networks, come on. Which, you mean where I've been? Yeah. It's easier to list the ones where I haven't been. <laughs> <laughs> ABC, uh, uh, ABC, NBC. NBC, CBS local, Channel 2, anchoring right. the news back in the 80s. Uh, Fox, uh, before Ailes. And a little bit after. Look, look at you. Uh, it's uh, pre ales uh, and after ales. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I wasn't hired by him. He, I, I we'll get into Leave that later. Leave it alone. Yeah. Leave it alone, it Mike. Yeah. And uh, Bloomberg Television as well. Absolutely. And Mike, Mike is here to talk to us. Uh, people know Mike from his uh, terrific work on public television. Um, but Mike is here to talk about this terrific series, the pilot we're about to see on the trail. Describe on the trail real quick before we take a look at the clip. Uh, basically, it's a glimpse at the, the near wilderness that exists at our doorstep here in the tri-state area and how you can see some extraordinary things and have extraordinary experiences by just getting out there on the trail. Your idea. You came up with this. Yeah. Why? Uh, because my, my wife one day looked at me uh, and said, I, I, I was looking at a lifetime of getting away from what we do for a living. And my biggest getaway was going out into nature and just losing myself for a while with her. And then she developed this love of the Appalachian Trail, all things Appalachian Trail. She'd read these trail blogs that would come in from the people doing the through hikes, uh, these folks that would go from Georgia to Maine or vice versa. And she would read the stories and these experiences and these amazing people and she'd say, uh, this is some good stuff. And I'd say, yeah, somebody should do this as a show. And she looked somebody. at me and she said, why don't you? <laughs> and I thought, yeah, why don't I? That's how it all came to be. It's on uh, the pilot aired on NJTV, the public television station here in New Jersey, NJ, excuse me, WNET, WLIW out in Long Island. Let's take a look at On the Trail with Mike Schneider. We set off. Many have walked these paths, but to most, their wonders remain unknown. Around every bend, something new. A story from the past, a fellow hiker to meet. From the country's most recognizable trail to local landmarks, there's something out here for everyone, and it's closer than you think. I'm Mike Schneider. I hope you'll join me on the trail. What are we looking at, Mike? Delaware Water Gap, uh, Mount Tammany, which is the highest peak over there. As you look out over the Delaware River, about 1,300 feet below you, across to Mount Mincy in Pennsylvania, people have no idea New Jersey looks like that. Even New Jerseyans, in many cases, have no idea that it's not that far away, and all you have to do is just put on a good pair of, of sneakers or hiking shoes, and you get to experience that. And once you, once you do a trail like that and see, I mean, you've got eagles and, and buzzards and, mm -hmm. and falcons flying below you. Once you experience stuff like that, especially if you have kids, it's just unbelievable. It's life transforming. Now, you and I were just talking right before we got in the air. Mike and I have known each other for years, worked together for a long time. We talked about the idea of kids and our teenagers who 
-hmm. let's just say, way too much time on the video games and the digital world and their heads down and not looking up. Yep. Part of your goal was to say, hey, enough. Let's get out there. Live, live your life out Absolutely. there, not here, right? Absolutely. And one of the reasons, I mean, once again, I have my wife to thank for that. She's a pediatrician. And in her office, in her practice over all these years, she's seen kids spend more and more time inside and more kids and more kids having problems with obesity, uh, diabetes developing far earlier in, in, you know, in numbers that are shocking. And so anything you can do to get your kids out, I know you're a big believer in this as well, into the fresh air, into, into nature. You know, why live virtual reality when you can live reality? Mm. The other thing that's so fascinating to me, Mike, is because your career is so impressive, because you've accomplished so much, I've always thought about this. For those of us who have decided to make this our professional life, we think, okay, this is what we're gonna do, and everyone comes to you and says, Mike, how do I do it? How do I succeed in this business? Is it fair to say that the reality is you have to keep evolving, keep changing, and there, was, there is no secret to it, like this is the thing you do? Is it, I know it sounds complicated, but you're constantly evolving. You have to. I mean, and sometimes you do it against your own inclinations. You know, you get into a business like I did so long ago, like we did, and you know, you have a goal. I want to be the anchorman at Channel you're 2. You're the anchorman. And I was, but then you say, oh, what do I do next? Because if you have that kind of fire in your belly, it's always that, okay, what comes next? And that's part of why I did this show as well, because that can be both inspirational, but it also can be very dangerous. Because it, it, in my case, and I can't generalize, in my case, I got so hooked on this need to succeed and to take it to the next level and to where do I go from here? And I got there so young, what else is there in life that I don't know that I necessarily appreciated everything because I was too busy running. You know, I'm a former sprinter. I wanted to go fast, I want right. the race to end and start the next race. And when I evolved to this level, I, I realized I could actually take a deep breath and enjoy exactly being in the moment. You know, it's so interesting. I don't think people can appreciate, or and I want you to help them appreciate, hiking is not something you said, oh, I think I'll do this now. It's been a part of your life. I started doing it, I'm, you know, my wife and I would do some casual hikes during vacations years ago. Uh, we were, I, when I was working in Miami, we'd do stuff down there, but we'd go out west and, and do some trails as well. It wasn't until later on we came back and we moved back to Jersey back in the mid-80s. I had some friends who were also very much interested in, in the outdoors, and, they, and we started going out on the trails. And the more we did it, you know, I, I talk about this in the show, I went along basically because I had a, a pal who was a drinking buddy, and we would go out, you know, it would be an excuse afterwards to throw back a couple of beers and tell the stories, that sort of thing. But then I realized it wasn't about the social stuff after the fact. The social right. stuff was occurring out there. And I guess two decades plus later, it became more than just a, what do I want to do on the weekends? I guess we'll go hiking. It's I can't wait for the weekends so I can go hiking to the point where I moved to a place where mm. trails are out my back door. But think about this for a second, Mike. We're taping right here in the heart of Newark, New Jersey on the campus of NJIT. We're part of this University Heights section, NJIT, Rutgers, right. uh, uh, Seton Hall University Law School, um, Essex County College, Berkeley University, everyone's here, right? right. They say, well, we're in an urban setting. Uh -huh. What are you doing talking to me about hiking? You say? Your trails are mm -hmm. in your backyard. You, if you take out a map of New Jersey and take a look at all the green stuff on that map, you'll find that there are parks filled with trails nearby. You don't have to go far at all to find a good local trail. Uh, Jersey has done a wonderful job of, of developing parks. New York State, if you live on the other side of the border, a wonderful job of developing parks as well. So it's all there. And plus, if you, you know, you just saw stuff from the Delaware Water Gap. That's from here. It's, it's, far it's away. an hour and a half at the most. And that's, that's with it. traffic. That's with traffic. <clears throat> right. Where do, you, where do you want to see the series go, Mike? Uh, w the goal is basically, you know, we have our, this is ground zero for us. We, we're going we're gonna to show Jersey in a way that it hasn't been shown before, and the whole tri-state area as well. But the idea is to take the next step, is to, we're going to, I've already shot video, my wife and I have, from Georgia to Maine, uh, increments of the Appalachian Trail, to expose people to what it's like uh, as you do this. And you don't have to be gung-ho, do the entire trail. You can do segments of it. But sometimes, you know, it, it, we're talking about the kids. Put the kids in the car, drive to Virginia if you want, mm. and do sections of Skyline Drive and the trail off of that, and you'll see what I mean. Or, or better yet, just you know, go to Bear Mountain in New yep. York or, or go up to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Weiwei Onda in Jersey. Get out into those places like that.
Last question, Mike. Um, the other part of television is that we always are raising money to do what we have to do. <laughs> I've heard. Yes, yeah, so that brings a <laughs> smile to your face. And yeah. again, it's a big part of my job and any one of us yes, who are sir. part of this. You mind if I plug again? I would be appreciative, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is called uh, On the Trail with our great friend uh, from PBS. Um, so many other great jobs before that in broadcasting, but he continues to do great work. Mike Schneider, On the Trail, check it out. And uh, we wish you nothing but the best, partner. Thank you, my friend. Keep it up. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be right back from uh, NJIT at the Jim Wise Theater. Great stuff. Right back. To watch more One on One with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Uh, the public television family is honored to welcome with us Colonel Tom Hebert, um, retired Colonel, the Senior Director of Veterans Initiatives at ADP. Good to see you, Colonel. Thank you. It's great to be here. You were just telling me before we uh, got on the air, you call yourself a quote-unquote Army brat. Define that. So, so the, the military has always defined Army brats as, as the children of serving active duty military. And so I grew up all over the world. My, my father served in the Army for 33 years. I, I grew up in Germany, Japan, Korea. Uh, all five of my brothers and sisters served in the military. Uh, I married a, a gal in the Army, and, and all three of her brothers also served in the Army. So I, you know, I truly am a military brat, raising military brats. Thank you and your family for your great service to our country. Uh, ADP, this connection to helping veterans, what is, you've been there for 14 months at ADP. I have. What exactly are you trying to accomplish, and, and, and I'll complicate it by asking this, what are the challenges that veterans are facing as they come home in terms of finding employment? Well, the, the, the big challenge is, is veterans being able to translate their skills, and, and in many cases, uh, employers all over the country aren't aren't really familiar with what those skills are. So at ADP, we, we really believe that veterans possess incredible integrity, uh, an innovative spirit, uh, they're initiative driven, they're resilient, uh, and, and they have this commitment to service that we believe at ADP really fits in well. But in addition to you know, those intangible skills, they also have, have spent their time in the military being trained in leadership and management and all sorts of other tangible, hard skills that, that uh, we believe at ADP we can take advantage of. So, so what's the mismatch? I said to you before we got on the air that my sense is that there may be a mismatch, a mismatch between what vets bring to the table as potential employees, as leaders in, in, in the workplace, and what some, some potential employers think they bring to the workplace. There is a mismatch. There is. In some cases. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, I think a lot of it is a perception. A lot of it is a stereotype of, of what, what uh, people who are unfamiliar with what veterans do while they're serving, uh, those skills they possess. And so at ADP, we spend a lot of time talking to our hiring managers about how the skills that veterans possess translate to roles at ADP. And I think we've been very successful so far. Break it down. Give us uh, success is defined in different ways. Give us some concrete examples of that success. Yeah, so, so the year before I got here uh, to now, we hired about four times as many veterans this past year relative to the year before. We're looking to double that this year. We, literally, we want to hire hundreds of veterans to ADP this year, something we weren't doing 15, 16 months ago. The other thing that's so interesting to me, as a student of leadership, I'm struck by the concept of team. I mean, this production, I mean, there are the wonderful people behind the scenes, great camera people here, a group of people in the control room that is usually pretty much under control. I mean, there's a tremendous team behind this production. It's a team. Absolutely. It's not an yeah. individual. Connect that to those who serve. Yeah, so, so one of the things that I also tell uh, leaders at ADP that, that veterans bring to our company is this idea of team. Vet veterans, active duty service members are very, very comfortable with serving as members of teams, leading teams through some impre incredibly difficult challenges. And so uh, that teamwork translated into what we do for our clients at ADP is huge. And, and you know, I absolutely uh, agree that that is a huge component of what veterans can bring to a company. Talk a little bit, Colonel, about veterans post 9-11. So, so post 9-11, you know, the, the, uh, the VA... Are they the, different? Is it different? I, I think it's a lot different. 
And, 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 and it's different in, in the sense, I was speaking to somebody about this the other day, that, that I think my father was, was a Vietnam veteran, and I think uh, the, the reception that Vietnam veterans got when they returned to this country in the mid-1970s, early mid-1970s, was not good. And so I, I think the, the, the outpouring of support that you see for veterans across the United States now is really being led by that group of Vietnam veterans in different parts of, of, of organizations across the country, both government and, and private, who wanted to make sure that this didn't happen again. And so there, there are really are lots and lots of resources out there available to veterans as they transition out of the military. But, but talk about some of the, the, the vets post 9-11. What specific issues do you believe they face? Well, I, th I think moving out of the roles that they had in the military and translating their skills into uh, roles in corporate America. Uh, I think that's the number one uh, issue. Also, we, getting back to that idea of team, veterans are never very good at selling themselves. Why is that? Well, because their, their whole environment in the military has been focused on the team and not on themselves. And so when they get in to interviews, and we talk about this at ADP all the time, they're not very good with selling themselves. So we are actually uh, involved in a concerted effort around the country with our current veterans in ADP to help veterans as they transition with, with building their resumes, with preparing for interviews. And we're, we're, the flip side of that is we're also <coughs> helping our managers to understand this issue of interviewing it, as It's well. so interesting as you talk about that, you know, I, I, one of the books I, I wrote previously, because I'm not uncomfortable talking about, you know, self-promotion in a hopefully respectful way, was, is, is, the book I wrote is called You Are the Brand. And so I'm thinking about this in the context of what you're talking about. It's totally antithetical to that, which is you are the brand. So you go in for an interview. Someone's going in who gave great service to this country, has tremendous skills, and someone asks them, what do you bring to the table? How would you be great for our company? And you're saying that many of these vets find that very uncomfortable to even talk yeah, about themselves. Right. Absolutely. That they are a brand, they are, have a reputation that's valuable. Right. Now and I what do you do with that? Well, again, I think it's, it's about education, right? It's education on both levels, educating the veterans as they transition in our larger, larger offices around the country that are co-located near military bases. We spend time with our own right. uh, veteran associates helping these transitioning veterans out, but it's also a matter of educating our own managers. And they have to be committed to it. Last question. Um, Colonel, uh, leadership. The number one leadership challenge that you have faced over your many years in the military and now at ADP? Number one leadership challenge is? Well, I think the challenge is, 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 is teamwork, right? You're getting the team to come together to accomplish the mission, right? In, in, in the Army, we always used to say, mission first, soldiers always. Right? The mission has to get done, but you're never going to get the mission accomplished if you don't take care of your people. And so one of the things I tell our hiring managers all the time is that this trust component that veterans bring to ADP, trust both in, you know, in terms of trust that, a, that a, a leader can have in his subordinate, but also that subordinates uh, have in their leaders. This is, to me, the primary focus of leadership is building trust, and veterans bring that to ADP in a big way. Colonel, thank you for what you've done for our country. Thank you and your colleagues at ADP for what you're doing today for those vets who need all the help. There's a lot of rhetoric around this, very little action, but you guys are behind it. Thank you, Colonel. Thank you. Colonel Tom Hebert, um, Senior Director of Veterans Initiatives at ADP. Thanks, Colonel. All the best there right there. We'll be right back from NJIT right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are honored to be joined by Zach Rice, who is a Prudential Spirit of Community Honoree, and his mom, Shannon Rice, welcome. Thank you. Thank what you. a great story. Now, you are the uh, 2016 uh, Prudential Spirit of Community Award honoree, selected nationwide as one of the top young people. You're 13 years old. What's, this, what's your story? It's a very long one, but I'll try to shorten it a little. I was in fourth grade, and I got strep throat that went totally undiagnosed. And Surprisingly, it travels throughout your body and it landed in my hip and that started a septic hip infection. 
that I, I was a goalie, so as you can see, it kind of got me away from it. Mm. And in the hospital, we didn't really think much of it at the time, but my dad brought in a PS3 from home and it distracted me from my pain. And so that's all done. And there is like this really, really, really small chance that out of this rare illness, I will get another one where my hip bone actually dies. And it doesn't like have a funeral and everything. No, no, no it, it gets soft. And picture this as the femoral head. Whenever I was walking, it was getting a little bit flatter and flatter. Luckily, we caught it early. And uh, then I was in the hospital. It was much worse, way more painful. And this time, we couldn't bring in a gaming system. And it really brought to light how much I was distracted. And I had this thing. It's called an external fixator. Really kind of new. I had seven metal pins, three here like on my thigh, three near my butt, and then one kind of by my hip, and it, it lessened the impact of, impact of me walking, and it allowed it time to heal. But as I was in this giant amount of pain, and I actually had a hospital bed in my home, we were inching me out of it for about 45 minutes a day, and I, and I turned to my mom, and I say, hey, can I start a charity? You said, can I start a charity? Mm -hmm. Why? I just, I wanted other kids to be distracted with the gaming systems because I knew how much that kind of distracted me from my pain and it just kind of took me out of that world. So I asked and though she almost had a heart attack, thought it over a little bit, but she she found people, we found people, and we are now in our fourth year of the Action for Distraction, or we're on our fifth year now. Zach, we're gonna put up the uh, site for Action for Distraction 5K, raising money for? We raise money for Goryeb Children's Hospital, and the idea is to buy gaming systems for the hospital so that kids have something to distract them from their pain. This kid tells you, your son tells you, he's in this excruciating pain, he's your little boy. Right. And he says to you, yeah, mom, I want to help other kids, you say. I wish I could say right away, I said, that is the most phenomenal thing I've ever heard. But the truth of the matter is, with the external fixator on, he wasn't able to go to school. He missed almost all of fifth grade. He was in excruciating pain. And it was taking a toll on the entire family. And so he said that he wanted to start a charity. And I, my first thought was great, because pretty much all I want to do is get through the day. Right. I mean, it literally would take 45 minutes just to get him out of bed. And that was after giving him pain medicine. So I'm thinking I want to get through the day. And he's thinking he wants to help other kids so that their hospital stays can be better than his was. So my first reaction was, there is no way we could possibly add something else to our plates. But of course, you don't tell a kid who's in so much pain and thinking of other kids instead of himself that yeah. he can't do this. My, my first thought was, let's do that when we're done with this. This isn't the right time. Let's do it next he year. He was like, we're doing it. He, he was like, like we're, we're doing do it. And, and you know what? He was right. And Prudential recognizes you and others are recognize you. Keep the site up for you, good guys. Why do you want to help other kids, Zach? <sighs> wow. That, that might be the hardest question. Why? It's a natural inclination for me, but if I was going to give a reason, it would definitely be just so I can inspire them so they could do good onto their community. And it can just start a cycle of goodness and make it overall a better place to live. Why not just feel sorry for yourself? It's not the kind of person I am. <laughs> did you know that before this happened? No. This really did bring to light and show me how important giving back is. So I'm, I'm a little sad that it kind of took a big push to do it, but I am really happy that I am. So in a limited time we had, boy, I wish we had a full half hour with you guys. So I'm going to ask you, what message do you want to send to everyone watching right now? Every mom, every, and then every kid. Every mom. 
I, you know, I, I think I think the biggest thing is that no matter what obstacles you're facing, we went through a very dark period when he was at his worst, when he was really, really sick. And he still has a lot of medical obstacles ahead of him. And you always ask that question, why did this happen? And And I think that for us and for Zach, obviously, in particular, at nine years old, all of his dreams were dashed. You know, he was going to be the next big hockey goalie. And at nine right. years old, he was told he can't ever play sports again. You can take any negative and turn it into something positive because this was huge. But, but the impact that he's having on the community and the world is huge and you can make a difference. Zach, 30 seconds. What do you want to say to every kid watching right now? It doesn't matter what kind of dream it is. If it's big, small, it doesn't matter. If you want it, make it come true. And hopefully it's a good dream and it'll benefit everybody. You're a good man. Thank you. You're making a difference, and you're going to make an even bigger difference as you get older. We're very proud of you in PBS. Keep it up, brother. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been provided by NJIT, TD Bank, PSE&G, the New Jersey Education Association, Century 21 Construction, Verizon, and by the North Ward Center. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been produced in cooperation with Fios One News. I think at NJIT there are a lot of smart students. I came to NJIT for mechanical engineering because within state it's one of uh, probably the top three schools for engineering. It sort of creates a friendly competition where you know you can learn from them. It's a great academic school. I feel I'm being challenged but at the same time I love the classes I'm taking. The atmosphere of being here is like a, being at an upstart company. It's that same kind of drive, that same kind of passion.